Hey everybody, welcome to uh, the GCT Network Studios today for the filming of Finding Christ in Cinema, episode number 72, right? We're on 72, 73. 73. Wow, 73. 73. Of Finding Christ in Cinema. What movie are we talking about today, Brendan? We are talking about The Kingdom of Heaven. Ridley Scott's Very Kingdom young. of Heaven. Yes. yes, it's a great film. We're excited to talk about this. Excellent uh, um, way to share the gospel with friends. You would think so with a movie named Kingdom of Heaven, wouldn't you? Well, you would think that. You would think that. Uh, and, and no, we are not doing the director's cut. Mia culpa, we didn't even know. Well, uh, we kind of we were given I, a hint, but we didn't realize that they were that you know it was uh, patron Saint Philip who said, "Hey, you need to watch the director's." Cut. I didn't know he was serious. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we we get suggestions from Philip all the time. We never take them seriously. So we have a <laughs> we have a few th uh, little decks to get in a row here before we start the show. But you will notice that the sound on this video you're probably most likely watching on YouTube after the fact, and the audio quality isn't that great on here. Uh, that's the interface that we're using between us and uh, Ustream, uh, our Ustream account. So for the high fidelity, you know, full out audio sound of the uh, podcast, get over to ChristInCinema.com and you can download all the past episodes. You can subscribe to the podcast in any of your favorite podcatchers, iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Pocket Casts, wherever finer podcasts are served. Um, ba -ba -ba. So Brendan... Brent C is already falling asleep. Sleepy time with Brendan. Yeah, because he has worn himself out in the chat room talking with David Gaddy of the <laughs> Theonauts podcast. He's the one suggesting room 237. We'll mention it at the end of the show, but we are here live in the studio each Thursday afternoon, Lord willing, at about uh, 4 p.m. Eastern time at uh, gctnetwork.com slash live. Ba -ba -bum, or get over to christincinema.com. And uh, click on the live tab up at the top. Mm, yes, yes. Okay. I will reset the pizza. Oh, let's go ahead and start this. We are recording now. Do you need to get pumped up? Yeah, let's get pumped up. Okay. This is your Great Commission Transmission. Yeah, you can yeah, get pumped, you up. pumped up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pumped up. Potatoes. I could just watch some wrestling. Okay. And get pumped up that way. We don't have any wrestling. No wrestling. No wrestling. No wrestling. David, do you watch wrestling? It's because you might like wrestling. Michael doesn't watch wrestling. You should watch wrestling. Michael, you can get free wrestling on YouTube. You should watch wrestling. All the all the drama. All the all the scripted fights. Not tell anyone else of your first things. Not tell anyone else of your first things. Not tell anyone else of your first things. It's a trap. Your taste buds can't handle flavor of that magnitude. It's a trap! One does not simply do it. It's a trap! The stuff like this begins to trust me. Aluminum. Linoleum. Aluminum. Linoleum. Red leather. Yellow leather. When is that movie going on the list? Not the radar. Dippy, dippy, baloney. David, you need to watch more wrestling. The music man. Watch more wrestling and you'll like it even more. Well, David will when you watch more 2001 Space Odyssey. When I watch more Doctor Who. Okay, so here we go. We'll restart the stopwatch, the pizza pizza. Now we're really getting ready to go here, YouTube watchers. Okay. Oh. Quiet on set. 
Hey, come on in. Admission is free. Grab a bowl of popcorn, extra butter, of course, and find a seat smack dab in the middle. It's time for Finding Christ in Cinema, episode number 73. I'm Michael. And I'm Brendan. Join us, and together we'll dig deeper into the silver screen classics of yesteryear, as well as the box office hits of today. We'll take a closer look at the stories they tell and see if we find the face of Jesus looking back. We're going to explore the deeper meanings of these films, their plots and their twists, the characters and their choices, and how we can relate them to the gospel of salvation and ultimately our christian walk you're tuned into finding christ in cinema on the gct network this is your great commission transmission why are you doing that <laughs> because i he, want i've he, wanted to do that for so long he's doing interpretive dance over here as i'm uh doing the as, introduction as doing the intro yeah. yes and you can see that on the video friends after the fact uh, that is posted on our youtube page uh, youtube.com forward slash GCTN TV. Yes. 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 Big week. But you know what I was thinking? Last episode, we talked about Mad Max Furiosa Road. No, no. Fury Road. Oh, Fury Road. Fury Road. Is it Furiosa or Furiosa? Uh, Oh, a... Oh, well. I I got a feeling someone else is going to ask the very same question. (laughs) I'll I'll give my answer then. I stole it. Yeah, I know you did. Okay, so, but that was a great episode for sharing the gospel. You know, and I didn't realize how many people, even of our own ilk, of our own brethren, love that movie. Yeah. Yeah, we'll hear more about that in the uh, feedback coming up later on. But did you have any addendums, afterthoughts? Oh, and another thing? I did, yes. What? One thing, and I didn't really understand it until this week, but one thing I really like about Mad Max Fury Road is that... Furiosa. It, 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 <laughs> it's that uh, it doesn't have the irony that is, I guess, associated with the post-apocalyptic film. Well, no, because Jeremy it's, Irony is in this film. that we're... No, Michael. <laughs> no, not Jeremy Irony. <laughs> But okay, no, we we just we have we have a a protagonist. Granted, he's pretty much a wallflower. Uh, we, 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 we we have a protagonist, and he hides behind a strong woman. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. No, but but he but he's very sincere. He's not a very sarcastic person. His character his character doesn't uh, do what's unexpected just for the sake of it being unexpected. Are you saying he's predictable? I, th- that is in there, okay. but I'm not saying that's a bad thing. All right, because and same thing with Furiosa. That, Furiosa. That no Furiosa. Oh, yeah. Same thing with Furiosa. She she doesn't break the norm just for the sake of breaking the norm. Her character wasn't written that way, and to me that that sincerity, that's what that's really what drew me back to the film. It's okay, just, it's so just you're talking them. you're talking irony, not Jeremy. Irony I- versus Irons. Sins- Jeremy Irons. <laughs> okay. FCC's very own. Okay, so Jeremy we're talking Irons. Jeremy Irons versus sincerity. Irony versus sincerity. Is that um is that a uh a, a technical term? Is that a, a well, tool? Uh going going back to uh that goes into literary uh criticism. Okay. And I and I guess now since since cinema is a bona fide art form. Right. Yes. Uh, we we agree to that. Yes, and and you in fact you uh, and I quote that uh, that uh, Mad Max uh, Fury Road is high art. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now uh, now there is irony in the film. For example, the character of Immortan Joe. Yes. How ironic that such a sickly like a physically sickly person is the leader of these people wields such power. Yeah. A weak that, body, but a powerful, a powerful grasp on the lower on the, and on power. Yeah. Wow. Okay. You know, it's it's okay. like like that's the image of irony that's in the film. Gotcha. The, and honestly, that to me adds to the effect of the way his character bows out. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, and we see that sincerity win through, and that's that's what I think people really like about this movie. Yeah. They just might not know it yet. Ah. Uh, well, for more on that, get back to episode number 72 of Finding Christ in Cinema. You'll find that at ChristinCinema.com. I just wanted to point out, now, Brendan uh, writes the show notes, writes the blog posts, I should say, because the show notes are, are a different uh, matter altogether. Um, but the blog posts is the article that goes
goes along with the episode to help readers and listeners focus in on what we spoke about mm -hmm. in, during the episode so that you can use that as your tool, your ministry tool uh, for your friends as you are uh, sitting there on your double-decker couch watching you know, Mad Max Fury, Fury Road, or <laughs> I'll never be able to say that. Movie. I'm just going to say Mad Max uh, or any of the other films that we cover. Uh, and he's writing those, uh, th those articles in the wee small hours of a Friday morning and, oh. and, and having them post uh, early Friday morning, about 5 a.m. or so, um, our time, so that the, it's ready for you Friday morning to get to your, uh, to your smart device so you can listen on your way to work and on your way to school or during your day. Um, and sometimes things get slipped through, such as oh, no. last episode was listed as Finding Christ in Cinema, episode number 73. Mad Max, oh no, Fury Road, and uh, I wake up Friday morning. And first thing I do is check the you know check the post and see, you know make sure it reads correctly and and smoothly, and uh, and I missed it the, for about an hour. I missed it, and I'm posting. You know, oh no! Stuff, sharing it with everybody. Oh wait a second! Oh <laughs> so no! Anyway, it was this now. What we're doing right now is episode number seventy-three. What are we going to be talking about today, Brendan? Oh, today we're talking about Ridley Scott's two thousand five Kingdom of Heaven. Epic. Yes. You want to go? Let's go. Let's go to the movies. I am Godfrey, the Baron of Ibelin. My son, I have 100 men at arms in Jerusalem. Will you come with me? Is it true that in Jerusalem I can erase my sins? We can find out together. Never use a low guard. Strike from high. What is this? You're all that survives me. Be without fear in the face of your enemies. Safeguard the helpless and do no wrong. That is your oath. And that's so you remember it. All are welcome in Jerusalem. You will protect the Pilgrim Road. Whatever you ask, I will serve. I was watching you today. I was. Born a servant. You are a princess. A woman in my place has two faces. One for the world, and one which she wears in private. When the king is dead, I will have the glory. Give me a war. That is what I do. Saul Hadin has crossed the Jordan with 200,000 men. What becomes of us? The world will decide. The world always decides. They're here. It is only one man. No. They're here. It has fallen to us to defend this city, not to protect these stones, but the people living within these walls. <laughs> As always, we are going to spoil this 10-year-old film. It's 10 years old. You only have yourself to blame. But we spoil movies here ah. on Finding Christ <laughs> in Cinema. You only have yourself to blame. <laughs> it's 10 years old. And this was a request by our very own patron saint, Ron of the Red Oaks. Go ahead and go ahead and press the button. What button? Oh. <laughs> Ron of the Red Oaks. Yes. <laughs> our own. Okay. Our, here, let's do this. And this movie was requested by our very own patron saint <laughs> of the Red Oaks. You like that? Yeah! Don't you? <laughs> Yay! More, sir. And more. He asked for this quite a long time ago, and and I had the movie, I had the D DVD in my collection, and I claimed to have never seen this film, and I was wrong. I was wrong. Um, obviously, it was in my collection, and and it wasn't until I got to King Baldwin I said, "Aha." 
I have seen this film. I, know this I don't now. know why I don't remember much about it. Maybe that'll kind of factor into a little bit of our conversation here as we are uh, talking up the film before diving into Christian themes. Um, yes, yes. Because there are two versions of this film, like there are of many others. And, and, and you know, our, another patron saint, uh, Philip, mentioned to us weeks ago, weeks and weeks ago, maybe even months now, that, hey, if you guys are doing Kingdom of Heaven, you really want to do the director's cut. Did it, we listen? No, we did not. It no. fell on on hard ground, mm. Philip. You sowed seeds on hard and, on hard hard hearts, and the the enemy came and swept them. It away. Swept them away. We forgot all about it until I read this little bit of trivia on IMDb. Deep IMDb. 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 I am DB. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Uh, both director Ridley Scott and writer William Monaghan felt that the unnamed character played by David Thewlis, FCC's very own David. Now, Michael, do we want to give this away? Do you want? What do you want? Oh, this part. Okay, I won't. Okay, so uh, let let's just put it this way: you lose what the story really is by watching the theatrical cut. Uh, in a nutshell. Um, the movie company was under the impression, a false impression from the get-go. Mm -hmm. They were under the impression that they were getting an action-adventure, you know, Indiana Jones-style... Epic war movie. Yes. Yeah. A, a movie about the, atrocity, the atrocities of the Crusades. Yes. And, um, and lo, when Ridley Scott uh, turned in a three-hour film, completed film, they said... What is this? What is this? What is this? And he says, that's my film. They said, no, 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 no. Dull, dull, dull. And it's too long. And that's too much story. And they cut it down by an hour. Or almost, huh? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. And, uh, and so Ridley Scott you know, says, hey, you guys ruined my movie. Okay, <laughs> You ruined my movie. Um, and, and so I'm thinking that maybe because the story was, and, and Brendan, you even said that it was a little bit hard for you to watch. It and, was. And why is that? Uh, well, just because it, it seemed like the editing and the, the cutting, not necessarily of like any certain scene in particular, but just the way the story flowed. Awkward, the, a little it awkward? Was, it was a little awkward. Okay. And, uh, I, I honestly, the first couple times I watched it, I couldn't watch it in one sitting because... To be honest, and Ron, I'm sorry. I thought it was boring. I just, okay. I was just. I'm thinking I, that's I, why I, I didn't Snoozeville. remember the film. Yeah, and I didn't remember watching this film. However, Ron, let's put this out there right away. This movie is awesome. Okay, the story is awesome, and from what we can glean about what is in the director's cut, makes it even that much more awesome. And Brendan and I, we think that this is going to be Kingdom of Heaven. Part one. Part one. And we are planning already on revisiting this film once we have the director's cut um, version in our hand. So, um, yes, we'll we'll, yeah. uh, we'll we'll figure out when we're going to do that second part. But uh, it is coming. Um, I, but I got to say, well, first of all, here, here's one thing, and this was in uh, Le Miserable as well. What are all these French folk doing with British accents? Can't, are there no French actors that, I mean, do the French despise the Brits so much that they won't even work with them? <laughs> Ain't no telling. There is a French uh, folk in this movie, at least one, and that would be uh, the uh, the leading lady, Ava Grain. Yes. She's French. Um, but other than that, it's a bunch of Brits. <laughs> And she didn't really even have that much of a French accent. Well, she was raised, I looked in, into um, her background, she was raised in, in English-speaking schools. Uh, went to English Well, that doesn't schools. help. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so anyway, um, so getting past that, you know, so at, it took me for my, my second viewing that I realized, oh, wait, this starts off in France. <laughs> I thought it was in England. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was just thinking, how odd, you know, man, I would love to show them to show the, uh, uh, how they got the, the armies, the king's armies across the channel. You know, to start there, I thought that would have been, and then oh no, wait, they're not on, <laughs> they're they're not on this side of the channel, yeah. uh, anyhow. Um, but an accolade, epic, epic in scope and presentation. In fact, they hearken back uh, or or liken it to a Cecil B. DeMille, you know, epic. Yep. 
Uh, do you agree with that? I would agree. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's big movie. Oh, big yeah. and beautiful. Oh, yeah. And the way in the, the, the shots and the scenery is just gorgeous. Mm-hmm. It's a gorgeous film. Um, you know, Ron, uh, patron saint, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> patron saint <laughs> did, did ask if I thought it was a little too gory. Now, when you're talking war that's taken place a thousand years ago or 2000 years ago, you know, back when, it, you know, real hand to hand combat melee. Whatnot. Yeah. Melee style, yes. yes. Or even, um, Braveheart. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, gory, gory. Yeah. But guess what? That's what war looks like when you're up close and personal like that, yeah. swinging axes and swords and, you know, trying to stab people in the face and all kinds of stuff. Uh, something I did notice about this movie on that note is that you never actually saw, like, someone... Like, you never actually, like, saw the the physical act of... A blade of, penetrating of, of skin. Flesh. Yeah, blade, yeah. You didn't see that, but what you saw... Was, copious amounts of blood was the well was the person or figure beside that person being, being killed splat- or the being horse splat- the horse yes. yes uh there's okay so when when oh what's his face uh balian first encounters that's legolas to you and i yes yeah uh when he first encounters his uh that other guy the one that says you know you'll be known by your enemies yes. before you even know that's them. an awesome scene yes we'll talk more about that okay you know, there's that whole fight between the servant, and, oh, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> the whole fight between that one dude and Balian. And Balian, he takes the sword, he goes for the slash, and then there's a quick uh, cutaway. Cutaway, thank you. A cutaway to the guy on the horse, and you see the blood splatter on the horse, splatter on him. Yeah. Horse freaks out. Yeah. Guy falls down, so and so. And then there's the scene later on in the movie when Reynald de Chatillon. And, hey, you did that good. Oh, thank you. Well, you, watch me butcher this one. And then the guy of lasagna. That one, that one not so good. He is the man of lasagna. <laughs> okay. Not the man of La Mancha. The man of <laughs> the guy. The man. Guy. Get it? Guy. Man. Yes, yes, the yes, man of it. lasagna. Okay. You know what? This is getting a little too you much. You know, now. I hate comedians. But, but no. Okay. There's that scene. Blood in mind. Uh, Saladin has those two standing beside each other. Saladin's apprentice offers a sword. He Saladin looks at it and then takes out his little paper cutter, <laughs> you know, letter opener. Yeah, just turns turns around, swish. But you don't see the actual swish. Right, what right. you see is that blood go onto. And I think that's that his is face. a gory picture. Yes, and that's that's more of a gory picture than had we actually seen yeah. the throat being cut. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and so uh, so yes, Ron, it was gore, but this I mean that's that was life. It was oh, it was I th- I think this depiction of it was better storytelling. Yeah, because it it gave you an image that you wouldn't expect to see. Ridley Scott then. is a man that knows what he's doing behind the camera. Yes, okay, uh, that's all there is to it. Indeed. Okay, now uh, speaking of Ridley Scott, I have to say that and and we're again we're just talking the theatrical version of this film. Didn't do it for me as much as Gladiator. Hmm. And I think, because they're both powerful stories, and I'm looking forward to seeing Kingdom of Heaven being told... Through Ridley Scott's eye. Right. Or mouth, or whatever. Yeah, his version of the film. and and uh, But even even the theatrical cut, the story is huge for me, and, and I got a lot out of it. But I think it comes down to... I'm going to have to say that it's going to be... Orlando Bloom, FCC's very own Orlando Bloom versus FCC's very own Russell Crowe and the, their screen presence. Um, now, this is purely subjective, uh, of course. But for me, uh, um, I mean, Orlando Bloom is fine. Uh, and he's a fine actor. But Russell Crowe is a commanding presence. Much the same as at the beginning of the movie when up comes, you know, FCC's very own Liam Neeson. Boom. Okay. All attention. This is Liam Neeson. He's on the screen now. You will watch him. You know? (laughs) Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, And, and, and you're going to be, you're going to wonder at his, at his acting ability. I think he's an, an amazing actor. Um, Again, and it's really that magnetism, I think. 
that he's able to draw eyes and draw attention to himself. Um, and uh, so Russell Crowe, as Maximus, was a much more powerful um, character to me than Orlando Bloom as Balian. Mm -hmm. But even saying that, I don't want to leave the impression that I didn't think that, that Orlando Bloom did an excellent job or that Balian wasn't an excellent character. I'm just saying as we're comparing, you know, two uh, Ridley Scott period epics, mm -hmm. you know, um, I think Gladiator beats out, still beats out this version of Kingdom of Heaven. What do you think? Give some thoughts. Well, uh, <clears throat> I mean, really, we, we, you know, we talked about this a little bit before the mics were hot. Um, I think, I think just to compare the characters, because that, because I feel like that's what we're getting down to is comparing just the characters, not Balian the and Maximus. Yes. Okay. The story being told through Maximus. Now, granted, I haven't watched Gladiator, like actually sat down and watched it in like, a while, like the rest of the world. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, I mean, oh, ever, at all? You've ever. only seen it? Yeah. Oh, we need to yeah. bump that up on See, the list. Well, because like I always catch it on TV oh, at the yeah, at the no, wrong no, time. No, no, you don't know the story. You 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 probably ought to stop talking right now. No, Brandon. no, no, no. Let oh. me let me <laughs> okay. let me let me keep talking. <laughs> okay. Uh, it just seems like Gladiator, the character, is more of that commanding presence than Balian, and I think that's because the message that. Ridley Scott was trying to tell through Balian was that of meekness and humility, taking care of the small things and in turn taking care of the big things. That's going to be my point later on. All right. All right. Because you kind of need that, that smaller figure to tell that story. Okay. I have to throw this out because listeners are thinking this right now. Okay. Maximus is only driven by his love for his wife and his son and his farm. That's all he cares about they really are the same type of a character they really are um and so when you watch it from the beginning and you'll see everything that's going on in, in maximus's life and his mind and and him going up to the real dumbledore the real dumbledore um at playing the emperor oh michael gambler no 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 the real dumbledore playing <laughs> playing the emperor and he's you know because he's a great warrior and he just won a battle won a decisive important battle for the emperor and he says can i go home now I just want to go home he's a spaniard he lives in spain can i go home to my wife and my son and my farm that's all he cares about. So uh, I just have to throw that out there because I know people like like Ron and well, Philip and 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 David Gaddy and and you know John Wilkerson. Everybody that's listening is thinking that. But um, I understand. So I think it's more like their personal styles. Okay. So that that's where the comparison would be. Where yes, Maximus is a likes to live the quiet life, uh, whatnot. But he was already renowned for his for his leadership for being a general that leads people to victory after victory after victory all for oh well Roman. there you go yeah okay so that that would be the difference i think okay then yes i i agree to that um and uh, uh but anyhow uh gosh now now i just want to watch gladiator yeah <laughs> okay more on this episode we'll come back to kingdom kingdom of it. let's let's end this show want to in the show. Yeah, I want to go watch Gladiator. Okay, all right. No. <laughs> okay, um, but uh, um, let, let me just, we got to do some shout outs. So let me just point this out. Primarily for me, this film, which is an awesome movie, is an excellent depiction of the difference between religion and the pure and undefiled religion that our friend James talks about in chapter one, verse 27 of, of the letter after it written after his own, the eponymous letter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, pure and undefiled religion. The titular. Yes. yes. Sorry. Versus religion. And we will talk more about that later on. What do you see in this film? What is, what, what's your main takeaway? The, the what? No, no, not the Christian themes, but I mean, what do you think? What, what? Oh, okay. An that's, overarching. That's, that's what I thought you were talking about. Yeah. Okay. Really, uh, I look back to when this movie was made, 2005, when it was being filmed, 2004 ish, yeah. maybe later of 2003, Three. being conceived 
like the idea of this story being conceived possibly in 2002, maybe, maybe now then again, I, I don't know the history of how this story came to be, how this film came to be. We're, we're, but it's we're, very, this is some mid rash on the part of uh, FCC yeah, here. Yes. Okay. Yes. You got some ointment for the mid rash. Yes, yes. We are conducting the mid rash. I, I just think it's, it's very important to note that this film came out four years after the attacks of September 11th, mm. 2001. Yes. Yes. And you know, after, after that day, uh, 9-11 after that day there's there's this tension between Christians and Muslims you know what else is new in the world yeah but it's 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 culminated to a new head laws are being enforced the Patriot Act all this stuff is coming about and here comes Ridley Scott with uh, with this movie that that's basically saying look they're actually being nicer than what we are Look, they they pray to they pray to God the same way we pray to God. Good point. What they, do you think he's trying to tell, teach us? Well, I, I I think he's trying to keep the peace. Wow. And, Blessed and, are the and, and for that he is to be commended. Yes. You know, like and this and honestly this is is it almost like, hey, can we step back for a moment and look at the big picture and just and just look and see yeah. that we're all people here? And, yes. Yeah. You, just because just because someone is of a different uh and 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 really, I think what Scott does. I'll get back to this in a second. He he wants to show the difference, like you said, between the nationalist religious view and the personal relationship with God yes. religious view. Yes, you know, religion isn't just a means to run a government. It's supposed to be a walk with God, and by showing by Ridley Scott showing these devout Muslims, as well as devout Christians, right. But then also showing the fanatic, as or as David uh, Thielis describes as the lunacy of these fanatics, showing that, and then we already have the lunacy of the Saracens in our mind because of 2011. Yes. Or because of 9-11. Yes, yes, yes. So I, I think that's why we didn't see a lot of the Muslim... Uh, depiction of evil, of wickedness. All like all, it's like all the wickedness in the movie comes from the Templars. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Now, um, Ridley Scott received letters from leaders of the Muslim community um, thanking him for his depiction, his his even handed, to quote, even handed depiction of Muslims mm-hmm. in this film. He also received death threats from Muslims saying that he was, you know, uh, depicting them as uneducated, you know, backwards, all kinds of, which I didn't see in the I film. I didn't even see I that. Uh. Right. And, oh, Sar- uh, what's it, Saladin? Yeah. He was a good guy. Well, yeah, he, he really was. Now, now of course, um, they are, they're worshiping a false god, okay? That's, True. That's, yeah. that's just a fact. But as we have found time and time again in the scripture, what is one of God's favorite ways of us reaching out to people? Starts with a K. <laughs> Kites. In, in, no, no, no. Oh, nope. Starts with a K. Yeah. Ends Chippers. with. Ends with. Kindness. K. Kindness. K. I, I feel like Sesame Street here. K. K. Kindness. K. Uh, we need some good music. Kindness. Kindness. That is, that is his best way of reaching out to people. Wow. Have, have we ever mentioned that before on Finding Christ in Cinema? Oh, I believe we have. <laughs> I, I really believe in we fact, have. In fact, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on in my uh, well-mannered frivolity section. Oh, good. But the most recent one that stands out to me is, uh, um, well, when we talked about uh, Star Wars, The Return of the Jedi. Episode 6? Yes. The Return of the Jedi, and that was just a, a, a few episodes ago. Um, that is one of the ways that that Luke brought balance to the Force by bringing Anakin back, bringing Anakin back to to the light side through kindness, and and that's written all over this film in the way that the Christians and the and the Muslims interact with each other under the leadership of King um, Baldwin and um, Saladin. Um, and how that is it is kept in in motion by knights such as uh, Godfrey and uh, um, uh, Tiberius and and others. Um, and no, you're not. I'm not going to. None of these guys. None of these devout Christians in the film are ever going to convert to 
uh, to the Muslim religion because they follow Christ, the true God. But they are not going to be ugly about it. If we can get along and everybody can, enjoy, can, can live in this space and we're going to respect each other, then that's going to open up the door for kindness leading to repentance. Yes. And we see that playing out in news stories every day. There are so many, uh, um, you know, m Muslims that are escaping, you know, uh, terrible conditions in certain parts of the world and making their way to Western countries and converting to Christianity. Now, in some cases, there people will do that, you know, as human nature um, dictates. Some people are doing that just strictly so that they can, hey, the, now they'll allow me in and I can, you know, um, this is expedient for me. But then there are others that are saying, I've always wanted to do this, but if you do this where I come from, you get killed, you know? Uh, and so anyway, great points on that. And I think we'll be able to pull a little bit more of that out of um, uh, some of the points that we're going to make, some of the uh, the nuggets that we're going to glean from this movie. How about some shout outs? Let's do it. This, is, this movie is just replete with FCC's very own... Uh, let, yes. Let's get the, yes. let's get through this pretty quick. Let's just pick out some uh, because if we're going to do another uh, uh, part two of this episode, we can we don't have to focus on everybody in mm -hmm. depth. Yep. Yep. Uh, so starting off with, oh man, can I? I got to talk about FCC's very own David Thulis. Go ahead and do okay, it, David Professor Lupin. Yes, Thulis. I love this guy. Yes, I love. His everything about him in every role that I've seen, the way that he carries himself, the way that he interacts with um, with the other characters, um, the the thought process that his character is going through, you can see it um, when he's mulling on something, you know, mm -hmm. on a thought, you know, whatever. He is this guy's an actor's actor, I think, um, and he's my favorite character in this film. Uh, mainly because he just provided me a, a, the best way to, to to pull out my point for this film. But oh, well, there you go. But his character, right from the very beginning, all the way to the very end, where he's going to ride out to war, you know, and 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 uh, Balian says, Yo, "Why are you going out there?" So, you know, this this you know this, mm, this it, is my orders. Yeah, that's what I got to do. Mm. He says, "And I'm going to tell your dad what kind of a man you've become," you know. <sighs> <laughs> Great stuff. Um, I don't know. Liam Neeson, FCC's very own. Very own. Liam. And we are proud to have him. Yes, we are. Qui Gon Jin. Um, Raz Al Ghul. Raz Al Ghul. A couple of characters, uh, uh, good cop, bad cop in Lego movie. Yes. <laughs> and, and just because he's not on the network as this character, but Aslan. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And I was just uh, um, thinking the other day of a movie that we need to get. Um, Rob Roy. Talk about another, you know, epic and uh, uh, Braveheart style film. Rob Roy needs to go on the list. Liam Neeson, I already mentioned, he's a commanding presence, especially. I mean, he's he's the voice of Aslan. You have to, when he speaks, you have to listen to, to you know, his voice. What is it with it? How do you have a voice like that? They say Liam Neeson is on the move. <laughs> How can anybody have a voice like that? It just okay. FCC's very own Orlando Legolas, whatever character he is in uh, Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Oh, I Bloom. can't even remember. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Pretty good. Chick Pretty magnet. Good. Okay, you Obviously, put him in a yeah. movie, especially when he was in his you know twenties, and and teenage girls show up to the theater no matter what it is, uh, because. But how do you? What do you think of his chops portraying? Um, uh, Balian, Balian, uh, Balian Whale. I thought he, I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, and the determination, uh, but also the uh, there's also a distance, a little bit of a distance there. You know, after his wife and his son were oh, taken yes, from him. Yes, in the very beginning of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, really. But I, I guess, think that carried through. Yeah, I was gonna say it was really throughout the whole film. It was a hurt. That's a, that's a broken individual. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, even though he is able to carry on. You know, just like in his blacksmith shop, and uh, one of the guys come in, one of the, well, I don't know if they're squires with a knight, right? Yeah, they were all squires mm -hmm. um, with uh, um, uh, with Aslan. And he says, you know, hey, what's that writing mean up there, you know, um, that's carved into the one of the, the posts in the mm -hmm. ceiling? And it basically means what, what kind of a man doesn't leave the world a better place? Yeah. You know, is a rough translation of mm -hmm. what that said. Um and, and, how, and how interesting that we return to that at the end of the movie. Yeah, well, mm. a lot of things that we return to in yeah. this film. 
Um, so, I'm the king of England. <laughs> so I think that he did a, a fine job portraying Balian in the pain, but honor and, and and is going to do what's right, even though he killed a priest. Well, that guy probably had it. You know, he was kind of asking for it. Was he? Who else? Uh, let's go and talk about uh, Martin Sokas, Sokas, I think. As the Guy de Lison. The guy of lasagna? The man of lasagna? Yes. Okay, he is FCC's very own Martin so, And I didn't know Sokas this. Because so. he plays... Uh, he plays Celeborn in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Celeborn is the husband of Gal- the Lady of the Wood, Galadriel. Mm. So when we first get mm. to Lothlorien, and he he's the man, the elf that that is accompanying Galadriel as they step come down the steps and, and address the Fellowship, while well, Galadriel does. They they butchered his character in the in that film. Um, Celeborn is much more important. Uh, than they even alluded to in the film. What is up with production companies cutting out what the... They need to stop it. Okay, okay, you talked about this scene. Alexander, I don't know, Siddig? Siddig? I don't know. Um, As uh, Imad, he was the man that said that that, 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 the, the, the knight, he was the servant of the knight. That fu- but then he wasn't the servant. Which is he a was great a servant, which he yes, wasn't. Yes, and yeah. it's a great. That whole scene is a is a great look into the character of Balian. Yeah, you know, he says that that is his horse. No, it can't be his horse. I just took this horse from the sea. This is my horse. You know, uh, uh, well, you need. It, this, why would he say that it's his horse? Because this is his land. I love it. That yeah. guy's a great actor. And yeah. He goes, uh, "I will not fight." Well, then you must give him his horse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that was a great exchange, and I think that guy Alexander is a, is a great actor and, and a very touching character, mm-hmm. and that gets back to that you know when you're talking about the political climate that this movie was made in. People are people, man, and I understand there are some crazy folk out there. ISIS, those guys are crazy. They're I mean they're rabid dogs, but there are plenty of people out there in the world that are Muslims, and I've known them that are normal people honorable people kind people mm-hmm. kind people and he is one of them his character Imad is one of them and plays through um uh, you know throughout the movie okay let's jump down here to uh Ava, Ava Grain. Grain. yes uh, as uh, Sibylla 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 I, I, I think Sibilla? I, I thought I heard both in the movie I don't know um I, I didn't know who this lady was I, I never yeah. seen her and we already mentioned that uh, she was you know she's French she's one of the only French uh, people that uh, that I know of in the cast um uh her character is intriguing to me in one scene that I'm not sure what it means and I wonder if you can find out better in the director's cut is when she's looking in the mirror after cutting her hair you know, and it's, I mean, it's a mirror like what they had back in those days, which wasn't all that great. Mm-hmm. And and eventually it transforms and it's, it's King Balian's leprous face in the reflection oh, yeah. looking back. And I'm wondering, what did, what, what was, what's Ridley Scott trying to tell me in this? What is she seeing? Why is she seeing her brother's leprous re- reflection? Is it because she's cutting her hair in shame? Um, and, and she's wondering about the shame that her brother felt being a leper. Hmm. I don't know, but that's something, I bet you that's something that could be explored pretty deeply. Yeah. Yeah. Who else? Oh, okay. 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 We need fanfare. (laughs) FCC. Uh, give us the echo. FCC's very own Brendan Brendan Gleason. Gleason. Yes. Oh, Brendan Mad-Eye, um, uh, Father, uh, Father John. Was it John? Father James. James. Yes. 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 Gleason. Oh, and he was the character. He was. Uh, he was Bill uh, uh, Gibson's sidekick in Braveheart too. He's the one they're throwing rocks yes. at each other. Yeah. They were kids together. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mentioned to you before the show. I didn't want to like his character. At nope. all. I, you know, I was repul. Yes. Wait. I mean, he's a repulsive character, and I didn't want to see my beloved Brendan Gleason portraying that character. Mm. And he, that was a grand slam home run of a, a depraved, sinful individual, a man of God, a Templar wearing the cross, you know, and these guys, these Templars, what is it with, you know, it's God's will. All you have to do is God wills it. Yeah. God wills it. One jerk just has to yell that out and then you could get the army to go and do something atrocious. Yep. Wow. That's that's mob mentality. Yes, it is. And he is a leader. I mean, he's this guy's a mad dog that w- always wants off. The, let me off the chain. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go and start a war. He's like the Joker. 
Wow. The Joker's a mad dog. I want to know who let him off the chain. <laughs> um, uh, I think really what got me was that scene when in in prison when uh, when the guy from Lasagna comes, and uh, and and uh, what's his character's name? What's uh, uh, Brendan Gleeson's character's name? Oh, uh, oh, oh, Renaud. Renaud de Chatillon. Yeah, he says you know he's doing that crazy marching dancing kind of thing in the you it's know like he's waltzing in his yes. jail cell he's just he's celebrating and the king is in heaven <laughs> <laughs> yes and Balion is dead yes yes ne and then and then Guy says now give me a war it's what I do mm -hmm. and then the other scene when you know after they attacked these these uh um you know uh, these Muslims attack and kill them all, and then there's Brendan Gleeson's character all covered with blood, and says, hey, you know, somebody's got to do it. He, he says, "I am what, what I, I am. am." Yep. Something else about uh, whoever who was okay. I want to look up real quick who was the screenwriter. Writing credits: William Monahan. This guy is all about uh, the repetition of wordplay for emphasis. Yes, I'm going to make. I'm going to save my other point on that for the net, for director's Part two. cut. But isn't it odd that a lot of the a lot of the Anglo good quote good characters who actually end up being depraved and yeah, you no know, sinful, a lot of them bef either as or near or nearly after they commit their sin, they say I am what I am. Yeah. Uh, Reynald does it as he's pillaging the the Muslim yeah. Muslim uh, little village or whatever. Sibylla says it right after. Well, after somewhere near the affair. Uh, in fact, and that's actually in one of my clips. Yes, yes. Oh, I'm telling you, William Monahan. Yeah. Shout out to you. Back to the actors. All okay. right, real quick then, real quick. Uh, FCC's very own. Jeremy Irons. Oh yeah, uh, Scar. Yeah. yeah no, oh wait. Scar. Oh wait. No, we haven't done Lion King God yet. Does, so God does not will we, that we do the I'll Lion King. No. <laughs> hey, that's all you have to do to debunk it. If, yeah. you're, a, if you're a, a Templar, all you got to do to debunk uh, you, it. You just got to shout. God wills it. God wills, God wills it. it. Oh, good. We got to go kill people. Um, yeah. But yes, Jeremy Irons as Tiberius, uh, a great character, and um, I can't wait to see Jeremy Irons as as um, Alfred um, Pennyworth. Yes. In in Batman versus Superman, let's we'll, we'll let's get back to him. On an, okay, King Baldwin. Now, Michael, played by Marlon Brando. Da, da, da. What? Before I came into the studio today, I still did not know who was King Baldwin. Edward yes. Norton. Yes, and I'm so thankful that he is FCC's very own now. Yes, he was uh, originally. He was not credited because he didn't want to be. He says I'm behind a mask the whole movie. Don't even credit me. I mean. <laughs> What kind of what kind of guy would do that? An actor, mm -hmm. you know, a true actor. Hey, just I'm I'm in the movie. I, you know, I hope that I did a great job. You don't have to credit me. I was behind a mask. You know, Man. I, I was happy to do it, and I thank you for the paycheck anyway. Um, <laughs> but uh, great character, and he acted behind a mask, and was still able to con convey deep. Things mm -hmm. I got to use the word things because he did, he he conveyed emotion he conveyed hope he com conveyed uh, um, uh, you know trust he conveyed respect he conveyed uh, um, cooperation he conveyed faith all from behind a mask mm -hmm. you could barely even see his eyes I yeah. mean so you don't you didn't even, even when he could one of them. Was, was, all, was bloodshot. Yeah, yeah, well, they had it, you know, because when you do finally see his face yeah. after he passes away, great job, Edward Norton. Um, I love him as an actor. You know, I first discovered him, uh, the film American History X, which is kind of like The Passion of the Christ. It's a film that you can't really, you should, you, it's, it's hard to watch more than once. Yeah. Because it's so disturbing. Um, okay, and then one more shout out, Brendan, for this episode. <laughs> Uh, um, before we move on, and I can't say his name at all, but the man who played Saladin, uh, got I already closed the window. Gossen Mas Masad or Masud, he's um, uh, from Damascus. Hey, Damascus, we know that town. 
And hey. this guy is a, a, a theater arts major, a professor, everything. Everything to do with theater, he, he's it. He has conquered it. Um, and his characterization of Saladin, you just have to watch the movie. And the, the historical character of Saladin, I just want to say one thing. When we're talking about honorable people and kind people and things like that, when he died, he's king. When he died, they said he didn't have enough money for his own funeral, to pay for his own funeral. The king, because in his day-to-day -day journeys, every anybody that was poor and in need, he gave them what they needed. Mm -hmm. Gave them money, took care of people. Took care of people. And you can see it on him on the scene after the first uh, battle of the siege of Jerusalem. When he's burying the mass grave of, of his soldiers and he weeps because, you know, um, he knows that the, there's something, you know, something ain't right, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah. But he's the king and he has to do what he has to do. Excellent cast, excellent acting, um, excellent writing, excellent directing, even on the theatrical cut. I, I have to say that I want Ron to hear that I really enjoyed this movie because he loves this film. Um, and and uh, and I really did. I really enjoyed the film. And now I want to let's transition. Transition. Seventy minutes. Okay, I'm gonna go real quick. Okay. My section is titled "I Desire Justice, Mercy, and Humility, Not Religion." Mm -hmm. Okay, so no, nothing funny about that. It's just <laughs> just is what it is. At the base of this story, I said it before. It's about justice, or doing what is right which includes mercy and humility oh boy i wonder if we can find those uh in the bible anywhere well we'll, we'll see if we can get to that maybe um so we see the dichotomy we've talked about it let's get a little bit deeper the dichotomy between those practicing religion and those seeking the kingdom of heaven those earnestly yes seeking the kingdom those of heaven. seeking looking for it we have popes and paupers. We have priests, templars and knights. We have kings and men. We have religious leaders aligned against the king. Oh, that... We do not want this man to reign over us. Mm -hmm. uh, thinking back to a little story there in Luke. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, so aligned against the king and those loyal to him. Balian has many rabbis. He has many teachers many spiritual guides that that helped to disciple him to teach him what is good he has taught you oh man what is good um you know he has um well he has his, his father godfrey and he and we hear him repeating godfrey's sayings and he does what his father does which is kind of also a picture of, of jesus when he says i i say what my father tells me to say what i see him do i do do we want to go ahead and just quickly read over what that oath is? Yeah, yeah, if you have it. Yes. Uh, he says, Be without fear in the face of your enemies. Be brave and upright that God may love thee. Speak the truth always, even if it leads to your death. Safeguard the helpless and do no wrong. Mm, yes. <laughs> and then give them a good whack across the side of the face. That's how you remember it. Yes, yeah, yeah. so you don't forget that. Um, so he has, he has Godfrey, he has King Baldwin. Who, there's a, a couple of great scenes between he and King Baldwin. Great wisdom being imparted, wisdom in love. That's what I like. And Edward Norton was able to portray that. He was speaking to a, a man, hey, I loved your father. In fact, your father taught me many things. Now I'm going to teach you some things that your father taught me. It's awesome. This is discipleship. This is mm -hmm. like, this is the church. This is what we're, we're supposed to be doing. And he also has the enigmatic David Professor Lupin Thulis, known only as Hospitaller. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have... Uh, we have the patriarch Heraclius of Jerusalem, and he's credited as his character's name is Jerusalem. So I don't understand how that works. I'm not Catholic. Uh, I don't know what, you know any of that kind of stuff. But regardless, here's <laughs> okay. He is a much different kind of a quote teacher. 
Um, so after the siege of the of the city, the initial siege, it was a siege that we just talked about, Saladin, who's outside the walls, he's outside, so he's burying his dead as is as is Muslim um, custom, burying the dead in this mass grave. But Balian, because he, he's trapped inside the walls, he's preparing to burn his dead. No burial. We're going to burn these people. This is, right off the bat, this is the acorn moment for me in this film. This is what you can seize on when you are, well, when you're sitting on your- Double-decker couch. With your friend or loved one watching Kingdom of Heaven. You that This scene, you go back to it. Remember the burial scene? And and you had uh, you had Jerusalem, Patriarch Heraclius of Jerusalem, simply known as Jerusalem for the, uh, from henceforth. Uh, well- He's trying to stop um, Balian from from uh, from what he's doing. You can't burn these people. Well, why not? When a body is burnt, it cannot be resurrected until judgment day. If we do not burn these bodies, we will all be dead of disease in three days. God will understand, my lord. And if he doesn't, then he is not God. And we need not worry. Now, most Christians are going to look at this scene and, or, and, and immediately say, that scene is blasphemous. I can't believe that Ridley Scott would allow that to be in the script. That, that, I shouldn't have even watched this movie. I didn't know it was a, a, you know, a left-wing conspiracy you know, to, to blaspheme God. No, liberal media. Yes, but let's look at this a little more closely, shall we? Mm, yeah. Yes, we shall. First mm. of all, what, uh, what Jerusalem says is you cannot burn these bodies. Why? Because a burned body cannot be resurrected until Judgment Day. Okay? Interjection. There's a lot that has to do with... <laughs> end times and the study of end times. We're not going to get into any of that. The what, eschaton. Yes, whatever you all believe about that, fine. Carry on, soldier. You know, uh, but um, it doesn't matter because Jerusalem is wrong anyway. Where do you find that in Scripture? Where do you find that? Thus saith the Lord: A burned body cannot be resurrected until Judgment Day. I, you're, you're, I, that's my, there. You go. There's your first listener challenge. Show me where that is. Okay. So <laughs> I, my my response, if I was Bailey, would be all really, really. Where'd you get that from? Point, point that one to yeah, me. Yeah, that sounds like ad hoc. You know, yeah. you just made that up right there mm -hmm. and now. But anyway, then then we get to the to the blaspheming. God will understand. And if he doesn't understand that, then he's not God, and we don't have a thing to worry about. Whoa. God will understand. Some would surely say that if Balian had faith, he would trust God to protect he and his soldiers from any disease that, that comes from, the, from these bodies. That's why he's burning them, to prevent disease. Well, if he had faith, he would trust God to protect them from that, right? Right? If it's his will to protect them, then he's going to protect the people from disease. Assuming, and this is assuming that this is a real law, which it's not. Okay, so, but for the sake of argument, let's pretend that it is. You can't burn bodies. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so, but isn't Balian sinning and blaspheming here? If God doesn't understand our acting on need, then he is not God, is what Balian says. Well, let's look at a parallel, Brendan, and see if this really is blasphemy. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. And I'm going to read out of the New English translation, and everybody is familiar with this story, but you may not have forgotten some of the import. <laughs> okay? At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on a Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pick heads of wheat and eat them. But when Jerusalem and the Templars and the priests of this film, Kingdom of Heaven, and the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is against the law to do on the Sabbath. He said, First of all, which you aren't going to find that, thou shalt not pick grains of it. You know, but anyway, sake of argument here. And Jesus doesn't correct him, but he does. <laughs> He doesn't. Yes. But he does. Haven't you read what David did 
says Jesus, when he and his companions were hungry? How he entered the house of God? They ate the sacred bread, which was against the law for him and his companions to eat. It was only lawful for the priests to eat this. Or have you not read in the law that the priests in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are not guilty? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. Which obviously he's speaking about himself. The one who, who gave those Sabbath commands, yes. right? However, again, they're hungry. Jesus didn't say... And I rebuked David and his men because they, they lacked the faith for God to provide the food. God did provide the food. Come on in here. Okay. Hey, let's go in the temple and eat the bread. We're starving to death. And God didn't strike him dead, which he very well could have. Mm -hmm. Okay. There, simply put, there are exceptions to the rules. Jesus says so. But... He continues with these Pharisees, and this is my key text right off the bat. And I had to use this because I tried to get you to use it last episode for Mad Max Furiosa Road, but you've refused to do it. So I'm using it on this episode, and it fits very nicely. Oh, well, there you go. Because he continues in verse 7, if you had known what this means, I want mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have, listen to it, you would not have condemned the innocent. It's what they were doing. The Pharisees are saying, you guys are doing this. It's unlawful. They're condemning them. You're condemned. You are condemned. Go and learn what this means. I want mercy and not sacrifice. If Once you learn to do that, what that means, you aren't going to condemn the innocent. You would not condemn me or these dead men, Balian could say to Jerusalem. You're condemning them. The, oh, they can't rise until the judgment day. And you're condemning me for doing... You're doing this to them. You, If you knew what mercy meant. So go and learn, Jesus said to the Pharisees. Go and learn. Go and learn. Your religion blinds you. Oh. Your religion blinds you. God desires mercy because... Okay, Brendan, we know that in this uh, this verse, and also uh, it, he also s quotes Hosea six chapter uh, verse six in uh, two chap two chapters earlier, Matthew ten. He also when he uh, calls Levi, hey, come follow me. Levi says, "Come over to my house. We're gonna have a party, yo." Uh, and 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 in come you know the tax collectors and the sinners and the Pharisees. Ah! Yep, they're standing on the outside door. They're looking. Yes. <gasps> Look at what he's doing in Look there. Look at that eating with tax and collectors and how, sinners. How dare yes. he? Yes. And what does Jesus say there? Come and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Well, that's in Hosea 6, uh, verse 6. You know, I, I've noticed with Jesus, he's not really saying anything new. <laughs> He just keeps repeating the Old Testament. <laughs> yes. You know? Well, he said it before, and I'll say it again. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Hosea chapter 6, and we know uh, the book of Hosea starts off, um, the first part is the short part, you know, the first three chapters. Um, Hosea is told to go and marry an unfaithful wife. God says, go and marry a wife that's going to cheat on you. Not only is she going to cheat on you, she is going to bear three children that are not yours. In fact, one of your sons is going to be called not my people. How would you like that? And this is my son. He's not my son. He's not my people. He has a daughter called not loved or unloved because she's not his. And this is a picture of Israel, the northern tribe, uh, the, the, the ten tribes in the north. That's who Hosea was mainly prophesying to. Um, you know, they left God. They cheated on him. They went whoring after other gods, all kinds of other things. And God says, I'm going to divorce you. I'm done with you. You're not my people anymore. But then some, you know, things are going to happen, and then I'm going to bring you back, and then you're going to be my people more. And, but anyway, going on, and then when you get to chapter uh, um, 5, at the end of chapter 5, I love this. <laughs> for I will be a lion to Ephraim. That's a nickname for the northern kingdom. And like a lion and like a great lion to Judah, the southern kingdom. I will tear them to pieces 
and go away. I will carry them off with no one to rescue them. Then I will return to my lair until they have borne their guilt and seek my face. In their misery, they will earnestly seek me. And then we get to chapter 6. Uh, where they say, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal, heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. Now we get down to verse 4. And God says, what can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist. Like the early dew that disappears. That's what your love is like. Therefore, therefore, because of that, because your love is like a vapor... I cut you in pieces with my prophets because your love is like the morning mist. I killed you with the words of my mouth. Then my judgments break forth like the morning sun. Boom, bright. That's what his judgments are like. And then he says this sandwich in there for I desire mercy, not sacrifice and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. And I, knowing that when, when, in the Jewish mindset, when you quote part of, I mean, they didn't have book, chapter, and verse, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they had books. And that's it. Mm -hmm. In the Jewish mindset, and this goes along with that book that you read several months ago, you know, seeing the, the you know. Oh, uh, misreading scripture through Western eyes. Yeah, so yeah. let's get back to an Eastern mindset. And when you quote something out of the, you know, out of scripture, you're quoting the context. Mm -hmm. People know because they don't go, oh, that was verse 6. Ah, that's not like what we do, especially in America. Go, right. Oh, oh, I found this verse. I have a verse. God gave me a verse, yeah. right? No, God doesn't give you a verse. He gives you a thought, right? A complete thought. Mm -hmm. But for my little pea brain, I'm going, this doesn't fit in context until... I'm reading again these, these two places where Jesus uses that where he quotes Hosea 6.6. 6. And let me read it to you this way and see if this makes more sense to you. What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. Therefore I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I killed you with the words of my mouth. Then my judgments go forth like the sun. For I desire to be merciful. I don't want your sacrifice. I want you to acknowledge me so that I can be merciful. I want you to acknowledge me more than I want your burnt offerings. Acknowledge me. Come back to me so that I can be merciful to you. It's like he's telling them to give him the opportunity to be merciful. Yes. Quit going the other direction. I desire mercy. Yeah. And not just me. Because I am merciful and I desire mercy, I expect you to desire to be merciful. I, de I desire it not only for me, but also for you to be merciful. Yes. yes. So now let's go over to Micah. Uh, Micah chapter 6. I'm going to read this out of the New King James ver Version, even though I'm not a fan of New King James Version. And this is a parallel here. Micah 6, uh, verses uh, 6 through 8. With what shall I come before the Lord? and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? but to do justly or right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's what he desires because that's what he is. He does justly. He does right. He is righteous. He is merciful. He loves to give mercy, and he loves for his people to be merciful. And walk humbly with me. Walk humbly. 
So he desires mercy because he desires us to allow him to be merciful. And he can be merciful to us when we, are, when we open up in, with mercy and with kindness and justice and humility. All the great men in this whole story are very humble men, even King Baldwin, mm -hmm. who's the king, and he has to behave as the king because he is the king, right? And a king has to do certain things that are kingly, and he has to be the leader, but he's a humble man, and he goes and he asks for help, even for, you know, uh, well, it's in, in a clip, uh, I don't know if we'll actually play it, but where he's talking to Balian and he says, now go out and, and protect the innocent and, and the helpless, and one day when I'm helpless, maybe you'll come back and protect me. Wow! You know, that's humility. Hmm. Okay, that was our little Bible study there of Hosea and Micah. But Balian's loyal friend, Almeric, okay, Back so, to the movie. Back to the movie, and this is after the, the big siege, where Balian was able to, hey, we're going to fortify, and we're going to focus at this hole in the wall, this space in the wall, and they won't, pa they won't get through. Mm -hmm. And it turns, it's a stalemate. That's what eventually happens. So the, on, the only thing next is, okay, well, we lay a siege and we starve you out. That would be the next step. That's what, that kind of warfare yeah. happens, right? But they go out to meet um, King... Um, Saladin, and Balian's loyal friend, um, Almeric, who I like, the bald guy, he says, um, he says they're going to ask for terms. They must ask for terms. I mean, we're at a stalemate. They've, we've got to come to an agreement here, yeah. right? Um, and, and, but, uh, um, but Jerusalem, that man that we love so much, he, he has a much different tact, Brendan, a different tact in these negotiations, and it goes a little something like this. Convert to Islam. Repent later. You've told me a lot about religion, Your Eminence. The guy who's saying, Balian, you can't burn these people because the law says that they won't, you know, blah, 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 and you're condemning them and you're condemning yourself. And, you know, the law, the law, the law, right? But then in the next, oh, when his next on the line, convert to Islam, repent later. Oh, I could have used that in my clip. See, do, he, do a little evil now. Yeah. For the greater good. Yes. Oh, Brendan's going to touch on that. <sighs> and see, but you know what that is, Brendan? That is, that's, that's religion. That's religion. Because religion is a way of conducting business with God. Do you remember last year? I mean, early in the history of the show, I told a little story about, uh, about Socrates and uh, um, uh, oh gosh, what is the uh, you, you uh, Socrates talking to you you for though you I can't remember right now. Where's you, my you Euthyphro. Yes, you Euthyphro. Euthyphro. Yeah. You, and they're waiting in line to go into the court. Uh, Socrates is going into to uh, to uh, argue for or to argue his defense for his life. Mm -hmm. Euthyphro is taking his father to court. You know, Socrates says Euthyphro. You know, hey, fancy meeting you here in line going to court. What are you here for? You know, oh, very wonderful thing. And not wonderful in our sense, wonderful in the classic sense. Like, you're going to be amazed when I tell you this. Oh. Uh, you know, I'm taking my dad to court. Why? For murder. What? What? You know, because his dad had a servant. Something happened. And, you know, uh, uh, unfortunate turn of events. The servant died. Euthyphro is taking his dad to court for murder. And Socrates is saying, wow, you, well, you're taking your dad to court for murder? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's right and just to the gods, and I'm a pious man. And so then that's when they get into the discussion of what is piety, which is religion, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what is piety? And, and it turns out that finally, as, as Euthyphro cannot answer what piety really is, Socrates is able to boil it down based on what he's saying. He says, so what you're saying really is that piety is a way of doing business between man and gods. Well... That's what this guy's religion is. That's what the Templar's religion is. That is what this religion is. Repent later. Sin now, repent later. Yeah, save your neck and then repent later. You know, got to buy it. I mean, this is our business contract. You know, just repent and everything's hunky-dory. What's his response? <laughs> you, have, you have taught me much about religion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll get out of here on my points. 
but not before I talk about the hospitaler. The one who hospitals. Yes. Well, that's really what it is. Um, and and uh, he the, it, that's an order. It was guys that took care of people, took care, bound up wounds, and I mean, he was a, he was a relig- It was a religious order. Anyway, we have this scene earlier early in the film. Um, uh, Balian is just new to Jerusalem. Really, had a chance to look around, and, and uh, he went to he went to um, where Christ was crucified. And he's looking for he's looking for salvation. He's looking for uh, forgiveness because he killed a priest. Okay, and he's looking for forgiveness on behalf of his wife because she killed herself after their child died. And he was told that, you know, that's a do not pass go. You know, it's straight to hell. She's burning in hell, by the way, without a head, is what the priest said. Mm-hmm. And then that's when Balian killed the priest yeah. because he smiles about it. Yeah. You know, um, and so here he is. He's going right to where Christ is crucified and wants forgiveness and comes back and, and uh, uh, well, has this great conversation with this enigmatic character, the Hospitaller. So, how fine, dear Jerusalem? God does not speak to me. Not even on the hill where Christ died. I am outside God's grace. I have not heard that. At any rate, it seems I have lost my religion. I put no stock in religion. By the word religion, I've seen the lunacy of fanatics of every denomination be called the will of God. Holiness is in right action and courage on behalf of those who cannot defend themselves. And goodness. What God desires is here and here. And what you decide to do every day, you will be a good man. Or not. He has shown you, O Balian, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly? to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And your key verse again was Matthew 12, verse 7. Jesus says, If you had known what this means, I want mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. Hmm. Great film showing the differences between religion and that pure and undefiled religion that James describes in chapter 1, verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress. And and also, and let's not forget, also to keep oneself unstained from the world. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that. So the Templars and that whole system, very worldly. God was it? God was it? Give me war. It's what I do. Ah. So, Brendan, that is what I gleaned from Kingdom of Heaven. Just one of the many things. So, do you have any questions, comments, piggybacks, editorials about that? Actually, one uh, one quite large piggyback. Okay. Uh, Your ha- whole point? Yeah, my yeah, whole okay. point. <laughs> uh, but now, it's I, I love that you, you drew on the difference between uh, the, the false piety and true piety. Because because true piety, true true, uh, what James says, undefiled mm-hmm. religion, yes. is it's demonstrable. Is, Let's make sure that we make that clear. Yes, yeah, pure and undefiled religion is demonstrable. Do you want to see what serving God is? Do you want to see what it looks like? To see it demonstrated. Yes, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Then follow Balian, follow the Hospitaller, follow Godfrey. Follow King Baldwin. Mm-hmm. Follow um, uh, even uh, Tiberius, and they will demonstrate what that means. Uh, even even when, let's see, even when Balian and oh, uh, Felix, the Hospitaller, yeah, they're they're walking around Godfrey's court. Uh, and they're well, not necessarily Godfrey's court, but they're 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 seeing the Templars being hanged. Yes, 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 yes. And that's um, uh, yeah, that's a that's a government court. I can't remember what that yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there's and it's the Muslims hanging the Templars because the Templars attacked the Muslims. Yeah, killed them, killed them, and 
Balian says, and these guys are being hung because of something the Pope said. And the hospital says, oh, yeah. But, but not what Jesus said. But says. not Christ. Yes, I think. And certainly yep. not this king. Yes. So, like, even right there, the hospitaler is already trying to plant the seeds that, look, religion is not a is not a, an earthly government. It's not uh, a government institution. It, it's not a, a nationalist view. It's not supposed to be that. Religion, holiness, goodness, is supposed to be do, taking care of the small things. The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, yes. 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 Now... Michael, in the kingdom of heaven, what makes a knight? There is no knight. Oh, no, a, a knight. A <laughs> oh, a knight. What makes a knight? It's this oath that we've already talked about. Oh, oh, in the film. In I'm the film. sorry. Yes, okay. Yes, sorry. In, in the kingdom of heaven, the film. Yes, okay. In the film, <laughs> kingdom of heaven, yes. <laughs> what makes a knight? It's that oath. I'll read it and again. And a smack in the mouth. Yes. yes. Well, that's so you remember it. <laughs> yes. I'll, I'll go ahead and read it again. Be without be, fear. Whoops, sorry. Be without fear in the face of your enemies. Be brave and upright that God may love thee. Speak the truth always, even if it leads to your death. Safeguard the helpless and do no wrong. That's what I read. I, I know. Now, it, it, I'm surprised you didn't go to your favorite book in the Bible, you know, good old Isaiah. Well, I got to give it a break. Every how many, once in a while. how many times in Isaiah do we hear something like learn to do good, <laughs> seek justice, help the yeah. oppressed, mm -hmm. defend the cause of the orphans, fight for the rights of the widows. That's a, uh, that's Isaiah one seventeen out of the NLT for you. How many times do we hear that throughout, oh, it's all, it, throughout the whole yeah, it's a Old Testament? It's a constant refrain. Yes, mm -hmm. and it's. Oh, I'm, I'm glad it's in there. Uh, yeah, we need it. <laughs> and we uh, we see this. Uh, we see the hospital are trying to plant this seed in Balian. We see everyone trying to disciple Balian, basically what you just said, into doing these right things. And there's there's one scene in particular that I want to focus on. Now, this is the scene, uh, you know, what happened before. Reynald has just been publicly punished for his atrocities. For, well, some of his atrocities. Not his, not yeah. his major atrocities, but his, his, the, I think he attacked the caravan that was in the midst of traveling. Yes. He just, he just attacked them, laid waste to them. But the king and Tiberius, they, they need something a little bit more. And they they want to take full revenge on Reynald and really the man of lasagna, Guy de Luzion. That's the best I can do. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, and they they know the really the best way to do this is to bring in Balian. Would you marry my sister Sibylla? Were she free of Guy de Luzion? And Guy. He would be executed, along with his knights who do not sway religions. I cannot be the cause of that. Whatever you ask, I will serve. A king may move a man, you said, but the soul belongs to the man. Yes, I did. You have my love and my answer. Oh, so be it. See, <laughs> I love that scene. Yes. I love, but it doesn't end there. Okay, so just a, a quick recap. The plan is for, you know, once, once the man of lasagna has been executed, the plan is for Balian to marry Sibylla. That way, since Sibylla, Sibylla is the rightful heir to the throne, she's the, she's the brother of the king, therefore yes. she's the princess, and she would have the right to choose who would be king. And of course, if she marries someone who she loves, which by this time of the movie, we already know that Sibylla and Bailey and love each other. They've already had their, their little tryst, that's already happened, and... They want to expand this by actually giving Balian the opportunity to marry Sibylla and therefore become the new king. Yeah. But Balian does not want to be the cause 
of another man's of death. Another man's death. He does. He doesn't want that. Now, <clears throat> it, it could be argued that in this scene, he's also showing mercy to the man of La- absolutely to the, to the man of lasagna. Yes, he's because well, here let's let's listen to what Tiberius has to say after this. Uh, after they leave the room immediately, with the immediately after. All oh, right. Why do you protect him? Hmm? He's a man who insults you, hates you, kill you himself if he had the chance. But for the salvation of this kingdom, would it be so hard to marry Sibylla? Jerusalem has no need of a perfect knight. No. It is a kingdom of conscience. Or nothing. Oh, where did we first hear that? Now, immediately, yes. A kingdom of conscience. That is what Godfrey told Balian. That is what he told Balian. Balian's uh, a great disciple. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, that's what Godfrey told Balian shortly before his deathbed scene. Uh, it, was, it, was it the same day? Like that afternoon he was laying down? And uh, then, yeah, it and then that seemed night, like it. Yeah. It, at least that, in the theatrical cut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Mm, yes, <laughs> indeed. Uh, you know, you've got the the feverishly ill, uh, the man who thought who fought with an arrow. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. For two days. <laughs> For two days. <laughs> you know, you've got this guy who's who's dying, and then he's trying to pass on this message to Bailey, and he's trying to stick it in his head and say, "Look, this new kingdom of heaven, what that everyone's fighting for." This has to be a kingdom of conscience. And he doesn't mean just like, oh, everyone has to be aware that it's a kingdom. He's not yeah. saying consciousness. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> He's saying this has to be a kingdom of a clean conscience. Yeah. Something that you know, if you know, on on going forward, you won't just look back and say, Man, I wish I could have done that differently. I kind of missed the mark doing that. Or doing thus or doing so. Godfrey says you can't have that kind of kingdom. This is not what this kingdom is supposed to be. And and we can even listen to Tiberius's words. He says, "Why do you want to protect Guy? Yeah, he's a man. Kill you. He's a man who insults you, who hates you, who'd kill you himself if he had the chance. This man wants your blood, and he wants it now. And yet, because he's been discipled, yes, because he's seen the example, the demonstrative faith of his father Godfrey." Of, who of, lo- who does justly, loves mercy, and walks humbly with yes, God. Yes. He's seen that. He can latch on to it. He knows how to say no. He knows how to say no to Tiberius. And later, in fact, not even a minute later, <laughs> he knows how to say no to the woman he loves. Who are you to refuse a king? I am what I am. I offer you that. And the world. You say no. Do you think I'm like Guy? That I would sell my soul? There'll be a day when you will wish you had done a little evil to do a greater good. Wow, he really is a perfect knight. He has really taken his discipleship and understood what it means. What Really what it means. Uh, speaking of uh, Micah 6 verse 8. Uh, because even King Balian and Tiberius are both trying to get him to... Uh, to do this thing, they're, they're putting their trust in a a human system, this mm-hmm. this government. She's doing the same thing, and he's able to resist every one of them because he's hearkening back to his dad. Yep, his father's teachings. He he's he's sick. and and uh, th- uh, uh, Professor Lupin. Uh, yes, the hosp the hospitaler. Yeah. Yes, the hospitalier. It's just hospitaler. Hospitaler. Yes. Um, all these things, and and yet this is a man who believes that God is not with him. Yeah, he's still he's still obeying. He's obeying. Really, he's obeying God because well, he's looking it's, for an experience, the, though. That's the problem, isn't it? 
He's what looking for an experience with God. He first, you know, he he makes his way to Jerusalem. You know, his first question when he agrees to go to Jerusalem. Oh, he he wants to experience that forgiveness. Grace. Yes, he wants. Yes, to, he wants. He wants to feel what it feels like to have that burden lifted off his back. Yes, because he is a pilgrim. Yes, he is set to even defend the pilgrim road. Yes. Ooh. Yep. Ooh. But Can he. But all these connections. That's here. That's his mix up, and it takes it. Be, he thinks it's going to be something that is tangible. I'm going to experience this grace. I'm going to experience this forgiveness. I'm going to know that my wife is not in hell. I'm going to, you know, everything is going to be fine. Like, because my dad told me we'll find it in Jerusalem and I'm not finding it because he's looking for the wrong thing, even though he's doing the right things. And it takes a Muslim. It takes a Muslim to open his eyes. Right? Oh, it does. But before we get to that, yeah. just a quick note on that looking for the experience you know there was someone else who waited his whole life to have a religious experience and yet never received it and therefore never believed back in god who uh his name was sigmund freud ah uh, yes he he yes. never had what he called his moses moment and because of that really because of that he never got back to the faith that he was raised in which is a very interesting study on him now back to this film though yes it it takes someone outside of the christian faith to get him to realize look well let's just, just play the clip and if god does not love you how could you have done all the things that you have done peace be upon you and i come salam <laughs> he points it out to he, him he yeah. says look if god doesn't love you how could you have done all these things? Yeah. How how could you have been so so Christ-like? So God-like? How could you have how could you have been so much like God like this if God doesn't love you? I'm thinking that I should change my key text to um, Micah uh, 6 verses 6 through 8. <laughs> I, I got to read it again. I'll go because ahead. this is what this man's saying to Balian. This is what he's saying. Well, with what shall I come? before the Lord and bow myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? What can I do? Balian is asking this whole film. I've sat on the hill where Christ was crucified waiting for him to talk. What can I do to get this experience? But God says, here's your experience. Your experience is he's shown you, O Balian, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? And this man who just finished saying, this horse, it is not a very good horse. I shall not keep him. I shall not keep him. And he's saying, Balaam, wake up. Wake up. He doesn't want your rivers of oil and your 10,000 rams or the firstborn. He doesn't want anything you can bring him other than to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. That's your sign. You're doing that. God has already made the promise. You are forgiven. Wow. Wow. Yeah, there you go. I'm sorry. Did now, I... Oh, no, I was, I was just going to finish up. Okay. Uh, so, okay. So, well, you've got, you've got the Old Testament key verse. Let me bring in the New Testament. Do you know that? What did you say last week? The analog? Yeah. The, okay. Here, here's that New Testament plug in. And really, it's the whole chapter of Romans 12. Uh -huh. Huzzah! Romans, Huzzah! Romans 12. <laughs> if you haven't read it, why? You need to get on that. Why haven't you? Why? <laughs> there you go. Write us in it an even, essay as to why you have not read it. And it, it even starts off, use your lives as living sacrifices. And that is, that is what Balian has done this whole time. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm going to use 1221. Romans 1221 from the NLT don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by what? Doing good. Yay! By, oh, and, and pff, 
What is good? What, what, is, what good? is good? God uh, has shown you, O oh man, what is good. good. Well, good is being without fear in the face of your enemies. Ah. Being brave and upright so that God can love thee. Speaking the truth always, up, even if it leads to your death. And that goes back to Jerusalem saying, uh, convert now, repent later. You know what? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and play this sound clip because you just set it up perfectly. Uh, when uh, when when King Baldwin is having his first real discussion with Balian, and he said, you know, tells him how you know when I was uh, when I was a boy, you know, I thought I'd live to be a hundred years old. Now I see that I won't even live to be uh, thirty. 30. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, such is such is life. And then he continues on: a king may move a man, a father may claim a son. But remember that even when those who move you be kings or men of power, your soul is in your keeping alone. When you stand before God, you cannot say, but I was told by others to do thus, or that virtue was not convenient at the time. This will not suffice. Remember that. I will. Then go now to your father's house at Ibelin, and from there protect the pilgrim road, protect the helpless, and then perhaps one day when I am helpless, you will come and protect me. Wow. I'm telling you, man. Uh, It's good stuff. It is. You know what? You know who was right about covering this movie? (laughs) Of Of the the Red Red Oaks. Oaks. (laughs) Yes. Yes, he was. Even if it's just the theatrical cut. Yes. Yes. Wow. And I'm, I'm going to say after all this, I'm all the more hyped to watch and review for the show, the director's cut. No, and we will. That'll be uh, part two. Oh, man. Anything else? Man, I think we got it. All right. 70 minutes, baby. <laughs> oh, Oh, wait, we got to go to uh, uh, the Red Oaks Treehouse. Who? Uh, the Red Oaks Treehouse. It's a trap. No, 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 no. it's safe. No, it's safe. Hold on, General Agmar. <laughs> yeah, it's a, that guy thinks everything's a trap. <laughs> Man, he, that guy lives a life of fear. He does. He really does. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Ron uh, sent us in an email. He says, greetings and felicitations. I write to you in anticipation of what is sure to be one of my favorite Finding Christ in Cinema episodes. I sure, sidebar interjection, Brendan, I hope we didn't fail him on this show. I hope not, too. I didn't read this email that he sent in because I didn't want to be influenced by mm-hmm. his thoughts. Um, uh, because I know that his are going to be such a grand slam home run that he could just stand in as the third uh, host of this episode. So we'll let him stand on his own. So Brendan and I, um, we, we, we gleaned what we gleaned from the uh, theatrical version of this movie uh, purely on our own. Now let's continue with Ron. I thought I might go ahead and give my two cents regarding Kingdom of Heaven. The name says it all, but it is easy to miss the point of it all. I don't know if this movie has much history in it. Well, it does. It has some. That was Oh, that was an interjection. But, Ron says, it sure has... I can't help but interject. See, I just did it again. And I thought I had a problem with shiny things. Oh, man. Okay, so anyway, getting back to Ron. Uh, I don't know if this movie has much history in it, but it sure has a lot of lessons for believers and an unbelieving world. Let's begin with a theme in this movie, which we see early on. Quote, claiming something because you have a right to it, unquote. Ooh. I'm going to have an interjection on that later. Okay. Because I thought about bringing it up earlier, uh-huh. but this confirms it. So keep going. All right. So um, here we go with some points. Godfrey says that he has a, a, a claim or a right to the life of his son, Balian. The sheriff claims the right to bring Balian back for judgment. The German man-at-arms knows the law of the land and states that they have a right to trial by combat. The villainous uh, Guy de Lasagna states that Balian could not inherit in France. Um, In other words, he has no birthright. The king of Jerusalem, Baldwin IV, speaks of how a king may move a man because he has the authority or the right to do so. The Templars repeatedly proclaim... Echo, do the echo. Okay, right. God wills it! it. Okay, as a way of legitimizing their, quote, right, unquote, to make war 
and attack the Saracens uh, the, you know, slash Muslims. The bishop attempts to hold a claim over his servant because he has need of him and so on. Interjection. Okay. I think what he's saying, and we'll see if this pans out, I think he's going to make the point that all these claims are pretense. Ah. Pretense to the real situation at hand, to the real people at hand. Okay, explain once again. Pretense really means... What, acting on a belief that is not necessarily true? Well, not that it's necessarily true. It's just not appropriate to the situation. Okay, okay. It's it's a... It's, a state it's almost of, a non sequitur. Well, it's just... <laughs> well, yeah, it's just... Like, like what really gives you the right... Like, we have no relationship. Yeah. This is this is outside of what's already here in the present moment now. It's it's a... It's an outside force that that is believed to have influence on the president. But it tr really doesn't factor into it. Yeah. Okay. The true kingdom of heaven, Ron continues. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> continues. The true kingdom of heaven, to me, is best described by the hospitaler, <laughs> David Thewlis, Thewlis, as being in what God desires as he points to Balian's head and heart. It is emphasized even more when they witnessed the hangings of the Templars who killed the Arabs. Balian noted that they were dying for what their Pope would command them to do. But, not, but not Christ, I think. Yes, Hospitaller replies. But not Christ, I think. Mm. Here you see the divisions. Men desiring to establish a physical kingdom of heaven on earth, and on the other hand, Balian, who wishes to be a, quote, perfect, unquote, knight. We as believers are not of this world, and God's kingdom is not built with human hands or established by human governments. It is in the hearts and minds of believers who have been redeemed by the atoning blood of Christ. Christ does not want us to squabble like the rest of this world over possessions, politics, or mundane things, for those are not part of his kingdom. Yeah, you get a... I'm so glad the kids came out for Ron. Well, they, they, you know? they're waiting up, bated breath. We ought to, Ron continues, we ought to be about the kingdom's business. Mm. Mm. Mankind is my business. The common welfare is my business. More on that later. John 18, verse 36, out of the English Standard Version, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. In the words of King Baldwin, quote, A king may move a man, a father may claim a son, but remember that even when those who move you be kings or men of power, your soul is in your keeping alone. When you stand before God, you cannot say, But I was told by others to do thus, or that virtue was not convenient at the time. This will not suffice. Remember that. As uh, uh, Marlon, this will not suffice. Remember that. Remember that. This will not suffice. Remember that. <laughs> Anababalu. He's doing Anababalu. Marlon Brando. This will not suffice. He's, he's not replacing his R's with his B's. So. <laughs> Anababalu. It would be... Remember that. Remember <laughs> that. <laughs> That's fun. But Ron okay, continues. Ron continues. As Christians, we all need to be more mindful of what is Christ-like above what is patriotic, conservative, etc. The only thing we should be claiming is the precious blood of Christ. For without that, the rest is inconsequential... Interjection, truer words have never been spoken on Finding Christ in Cinema. Yay! He continues, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8, out of the authorized version, the King James Version, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion 
uh, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And finally, Balian's speech before the last battle stating, all have claim is not an ecumenical statement, but a resounding altar call that reminds me of whosoever will. Revelation chapter 22 verses or verse 17 out of the King James Version and the Spirit and the Bride say, come and let him that heareth say, come and let him that is, uh, uh, what is it? That is a thirst come and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely hearkening back to last episode mm. oh, that water that was an interjection john three sixteen out of the king james version for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life there is so much good stuff yet to be lifted out of this movie, and I can't wait to hear what you have found. Shout out to uh, patron St. Philip, who has been plugging GCTN shows on social media. Yay! Thanks once again for your ministry to me, my family, and others as you serve in the kingdom of heaven. Way to go, Brendan. Going for your master's degree. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Michael, for all your engineerification to make this ah! show happen. I love that. Clearly, you guys know what it means to be part of the kingdom of heaven. God bless Ron of the Red Oaks. God bless Ron of the Red Oaks. Oh, there was a... And I say... Oh, there, there was a comma there. And I say, God bless Ron... Uh, I say... Whoops. I say, God bless... <laughs> of the Red Oaks. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, thank you. Moving on. FCC's very own David Gaddy sent in an email... And you know when he sends in an email, he's got something to say, Brendan. Bubba does And it's usually he's calling me to task. But let's see. <laughs> hey, guys. David Gaddy here with the Theonaut with... The Theonauts Podcast. I just listened to the Mad Max of Furiosa Road episode, and I just want to say, awesome job of redeeming this movie and breaking it down. This was one of those episodes where I wanted to talk so bad, so I'll just do it now. Okay, first <laughs> off... I have I have to address 2001: A Space Odyssey. Oh, here we go. Stanley Kubrick. Everyone, just take a seat. We're gonna be here for a second. David went to film school. He knows all about Stanley Kubrick. So let's get ready to learn. That something. was Brendan's interjection. Yeah. Back to back to uh, to David. Okay, first off, oh wait, I already said that. Stanley Stanley Kubrick is a filmmaking genius. Brendan, this film is a must see film. <sighs> Don't tell me what I have to see. So okay, interjection. You will watch this movie, young man. Oh, man. Okay, because I'll, you will. That's you, that's on your viewing assignment. Okay? for Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. You should be watching the video right now, friend. <laughs> mm. You may not end up liking it, but it is a very well-made work of art. Michael, I understand why you didn't like it, but I want to defend it a little because it is one of my all-time favorites. 2001 actually does tell a definite story. Oh. It tells three stories, oh. which connect to complete an overarching one. Oh. What is often seen as a lack of story is actually the unconventional method of the narrative. Kubrick likes to manipulate his viewers to help tell his stories. Hey, that kind of harkens back to la our discussion last episode with the uh, Swiss cheese. Oh, yes. Kind of, huh? Yes, so the, maybe uh, the alienation Keep effect. that in mind. I'll bet you Brendan's going to love this movie, and he'll come and say, I don't know what you're talking about. It's better than Star Wars. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> uh, Michael just mocked me on the show. Uh, back to, uh, no, I mocked me through you. <laughs> better than Star Wars. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Getting back to David's letter. Kubrick uh, likes to manipulate his viewers to help tell his stories. The first two subplots contain little or no dialogue. Boy, he ain't kidding. Okay. <laughs> Oh, no. Sorry, that was an interjection as well. I can't stop myself. <laughs> uh, Ooh, most of those objects. long, drawn-out shots you mentioned occur in those first two segments. There are many ways to tell a story, and Kubrick can be unconventional about it. Those long shots are there for a reason. The overall theme of the film is the evolution of mankind occurring slowly over many years. Kubrick wanted to convey the slow passage of time and used long, lingering... I read it like... And used long, lingering shots to do so. 
Um, this is a film ripe with metaphors and symbols, but I'll save all the details for another time. By the way, The Shining is also a Kubrick film with long, drawn-out shots and is also a fave of mine. I will note that a lot of people, including the author Stephen King, hate the movie he's talking about, The Shining, as well because of Kubrick's unique form of storytelling. Bottom line is, watch 2001 with the mindset that it is a story told through experience more than exposition. So you are set up to watch this movie, Brendan. So I'm not, not going to have time. I, yes, I'm, you do. No. Yes, you do. <laughs> Brendan, uh, uh, David Gaddy wills it. So that, Everybody wills it! <laughs> okay, so back to the letter. Now on to Mad Max! I will start by saying that I wanted to hate this film. Michael, you and I are on the same page when it comes to the movies that are overly filled with CGI, action, flashy explosions, and noise. Like you, I disliked those Transformer movies for the same reason. It seems that today's viewers just want faster, louder, and bigger movies. Movies with no substance, but a lot of noise and special effects, all delivered in high definition and digital surround sound. Bam! Me? I want substance. Amen. I also like films with, with flawed characters who are redeemed because of honor. Ah, oh, keyword. After watching the trailers to Mad Max Fury Road, I had zero interest in seeing it. None. But a co-worker insisted that, I was, that it was meatier than it looked, so I watched. I will say that I was pleasantly surprised. Unlike your IMDb sources, I would give it 7 out of 10 stars. I disagree about this film not having a story. It has an honorable story that actually began a lot earlier for me uh, than, uh, than that uh, 1 hour, 15 minute, and 30 second mark. Smiley face. Yes. I, I, well, he's a smarter man than I am. What do you expect? Mm -hmm. I didn't put a timer on it, but for me, it occurred the minute I realized that Furiosa was attempting to smuggle the breeders out. Granted, this story is not overly complex, but it has an honorable struggle of good versus evil. This leads me to my first point, the depravity on display. You guys mentioned how over the top some of the de depravity is, mother's milk, violence, etc. I do not believe that uh, I do not believe this is gratuitous on the part of the filmmaker. It was depicted in a way that I believe was intended to be offensive and off-putting, which is exactly what you said. That's right. Interjections. <laughs> Back to the letter. Not remotely attractive in any relatable way. Brian Gadawa made a great point about this in my last interview with him. That would be on the Theonauts podcast. Uh, wait, on the which podcast? On the Theonauts podcast. From a storyteller's point of view, he said, the, po the power of redemption in a story is only equal to the power of what they are being redeemed out of. Well, yeah, I mean that's a that's a valid point. Hey, methinks I'm gonna write that one down. All right, back to the letter. I know I should have finished that episode. All that crazy stuff makes us detest and despise the situation of those people. Now, with the realization that Furiosa Furiosa is attempting to free people from this level of evil, draws us to her side. Honor, honor is my movie hot button, and this film is full of honor. Your honor. No. Uh, Furiosa is uh, full of it from the start. Nux is a flawed character, flawed character who finds redemption by following this honor. Max's honor is hard to find. No, no, no. Max's honor shines out when he struggles or suggests when he struggles to find a line. No. When he suggests they return. Man, that was an easy job when, for that guy. When he... <laughs> When they he had an easy job. When he rises from the yeah. wall, <laughs> from being a wallflower for yes. two hours of the movie. There you go. Okay, sorry. Um, Max's honor shines out when he suggests they return and liberate the Citadel. The film is just so full of high honor and willing sacrifices for the overall good that I can't help but to love it. Finally. Another interjection, though. Okay. Notice that, uh, well, hold on. We might have to go back and review it. But did they... Missed the mark in uh, in those willing sacrifices. Did they did they do a little evil for the greater good, or was it all good all the time? <laughs> we'll have to go back and watch that. Keep all going. right. Finally, a parting thought about the overabundance of action sequences. This usually turns me off. However, there were many things in these action sequences that set it apart from the norm for me. The lack of CGI is one. I'm in the software industry, but I have to say I really dislike 
overuse of CGI. I'd much rather see great practical effects in films, and George Miller leaned on practical effects over CGI in these sequences. Second, the vehicles in this film are more than just a means to create thrilling action sequences. They create an environment all their own. They may, could even be considered a character all their own. All I can say is George Miller must be a grease monkey gearhead in real life. All the talk of fuel, chrome, and combustible engines, along with the fact that the characters were actually lying on the hood spitting petrol into the blower to create a supercharge, goes beyond common vehicle action sequence. This is a guy who loves hot rods and rock and roll. Hence the guitar bungee cord hood ornament guy, parenthetically, which I had a lot of guilty pleasure about regardless of how cheesy it was. Didn't we all? No, we didn't all. No, I did. Oh my I God. loved so, it. Oh, so I could say, didn't y'all? Didn't yes. all y'all? Yeah. Because I, that's too much. Anyway, it doesn't matter what I think. Um, ba, 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 ba. So bottom line on this it didn't equate to just noise and action to me. It was a hot rod. It was hot rod art, and I thoroughly enjoyed it all. So the mix of art, honor, and redemption made this a really good film for me. Thanks again for your treatment of it. I thought the analysis you guys did was great and helpful to us in using the film to see Jesus. To God, be glory. To you God better, alone, you, be glory. You better say that in Latin. Uh, solo deo gloria. David. David. Yeah. <laughs> David of the... Theonauts! Oh, goodness. And we're not done. We're not even done. <laughs> this longest, oh! no, longest episode ever. Who goes there? It is I. It's a trap. No, it's not a trap. Quiet thyself, General Akbar. This is... Uh, uh, Patron St. Philip is going to take us to King Philip's stables. He says, great show again, guys. I love the fact that I can listen to an episode, even if I haven't seen the film yet, and still get something out of it. <laughs> I can't offer anything about Fury Road, but I would like Brendan to tell me. <clears throat> Is it pronounced Furiosa or Furiosa? <laughs> it's, 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 it, okay, okay, non-joking, it's Furiosa. No, it's Furiosa. No. It's Furiosa, not <laughs> Furiosa. <laughs> as far as Poor your Hermione. As far as your horror question goes, uh, now remember the question last week is what kind of horror movie do you like? Oh, okay. The, the supernatural or the psychological thriller and then uh, and then Michael you brought up A the Monkey Rich. The, the slasher. Yes. Yes. And Philip says, I like Michael's third category of slasher films. Finally, somebody likes something I have to say. Ugh, about time. Wow. It took 73 episodes. Man. <laughs> Which is what I'm I... I'm not bitter or anything. Uh, but, but hold on. Hey, I'm he, a good engineer. He says... <laughs> engineerification. Yes. <laughs> he says, I like Michael's third category of slasher films, which is what I dislike so much. Huh? What? Yes. Yeah, that's the category he dislikes. Although I'm a f I'm not a fan of horror, I do enjoy many films that have a horror element to them. Mm -hmm. Guillermo del Toro has an element of horror in pretty much everything he yeah. does, and yeah. I love his work. I also enjoy some psychological and super supernatural horror elements in film. The exorcism of Emily Rose comes to mind, as well as Signs and Warm Bodies, which stars Nicholas Holt. And yeah. Okay, so Nux is in that Warm Bodies, and that's somebody coming not, back from being a zombie or yes, something. Did you yes. see that? Not, No, not yet. Double Bill with Get Hard? I think... What? No? Okay. I don't... Don't that say what, like you don't know what, what the you... reference to Get Hard is. Your favorite movie. Oh, I, th I thought you I said, said Die Hard. No, Double Bill. Double... No, get out of here. Okay, go. Sorry. Get out of here. I really like Coraline, Paranorman, Nightmare Before Christmas. Hey. And the Box Trolls. Uh, and they have horror elements also. And let us not forget one of the greatest works of fiction in history, <gasps> A Christmas Carol. I can't wait till Christmas this year. We get to pick Slasher another version. films feel manipulative to me. Drum roll, please. As well as crass, exploitative. Ex how did Ex I exploitative. Exploitative. And there it is. Gratuitous. gratuitous. Yeah. I think uh, it's the age. Us middle-aged guys. We're, we're past that now. But hey... A Christmas Carol is the classic ghost story. Yeah. Let's be honest. Yeah. 
I'm praying for Brendan's decision about a master's degree. It sounds like a great idea to me. Brendon is a... Uh, I don't feel I right. should have read this. You should have read I'm this I'm praying one. for Brendan's decision about a master's degree. It sounds like a great idea to me. Brendan is a wise Christian, outgoing, smart, and a great people person. Being a drama teacher would be a great way for him to impact the lives of people while doing something he enjoys. A win-win! Philip, dang it. You, <laughs> the you, fields! The, the vapors. You got the vapors. He shot the fields all the way from Texas. Woo! Love, Love the, the show, guys. guys. Keep up the good work. Hashtag Mowing Giveaway! Wow, that was a mess of feedback. Anything else? I love <laughs> feedback. That's my favorite <laughs> segment. I think that's it. Are you well? Okay, then. Do you have any well-mannered frivolity? Oh, do I? Yes, but we'll go quickly. Okay, we will go quickly. Longest now, episode ever. Oh yes, seventy minutes. So the visit this week so on the happen. Monday movie review. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, M Night Shyamalan is back. Baby. Is he? Yes. Wow, that was so good. Were you excited? Oh yeah. So you walked down there and you said, thank you, M. Night Shyamalan, ding dong, because I was hoping that, where have you been? I did. I think my first impression was, where has M. Night Shyamalan been and why isn't there more of this? Yes. Okay. You know? Well, the excitement in your voice, I think that should entice people to get over to ChristinCinema.com and read your Monday movie review and get especially the Christian angle. Did you find one? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. But now I'm going to be honest. My, the Christian angle that I talk about is is the message of the movie. Okay, it's not like subversive like it was in War Room, where the filmmakers didn't yeah. even you know whatever. Okay, uh, this this one is you nailed the, it. You the identified obvious it. Point. Okay, yeah. Okay, so but again, Shyamalan does such a such a good job of showing it, and it being part, it actually being relevant to the story. It's guys, just go watch it. It's getting time for scary movie season. Go watch the visit. Do you have a uh, Monday movie review coming up for this next week? Oh, buddy. What? The Scorch Trial. Oh, Maze Runner Part 2. Yes, sir. Yes, oh. Sir. And initial oh. response? Oh, uh, oh, it was. it's really good. Now, granted, I have not seen the book. You haven't seen the book? I, I can show you the book. <laughs> I haven't read the book. <laughs> oh. <laughs> is what I meant to say. I have not read the book. And... You know, I hear obviously it's it's really different. I can't wait. I can't wait until this one comes out so we can have it on the list. On Patreon, Saint Philip presents the, the list. list. The list. I kind of I kind of want to wait the film series out before I go to the book. Okay. Well, yeah, you or probably the book series. might as well. Yeah, the so. book series is awesome though. All right. Hey, I mentioned it last episode, and it is a real thing now. A new video in the Follow Me series. Yes, Re I'm so excited. I'm so glad. What? <laughs> I, I love that series. Well, what that uh, was a couple of weeks ago. I mentioned we went to the Hope and Family Festival uh, here in Manchester, Tennessee, and I was able to interview one of the board of directors from the One Day of Hope event that's coming up in in october over four thousand people were served last year not served with uh with papers they were served with uh clothing and food and dental and medical um supply and haircuts and shoes i mean i just it's awesome so you can get to the main website gctnetwork.com and look for um i don't even know what it's called uh faith works in uh, at one day of hope I believe, and man, Brendan, I don't know how it how it coincided. Are you still doing your your study in the Book of James? Or are you done? No, no, I'm I'm still doing it because it's, I've it's, been. It's gotten very heavy. I've been hanging out in James. I mean, Let, next week, remind me, send me a text. I'll bring you the the book the book that I'm studying with. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. I'll just look at it. You know, I, I I'm just I'm really getting a a a different grasp, a more firm grasp on what James means when he says that, you know, faith without works is dead. You know, and, and you know the Anyway, go and watch that video, folks. Let me know what you think of that. Um, I'm looking to do some more of that uh, here in the near future. I like interviewing people cuz that 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 way you get um um you hear about I mean, Aslan's on the move, man. It just comes down to Aslan is on the move. Um, so, yeah. Brendan, what else? Well, this weekend, uh, well, uh, I guess technically next week, but Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, we're having auditions at the Fly 
for the Christmas show. Whoa. We're, we're getting it started. What are you going to do? Early as possible. Now, Michael, I got to say I'm excited because we are doing something that has never been done at the fly before. We're, we're accustomed to doing, you know, one big feature length show. However, this time it's going to be a short, a short one act play, a concert, and then another short one act play. Oh wow! It's going to be. Well, I'm, I'm in my head. I just keep hearing the word extravaganza. Ah, it's, nice. It's, it's, it's gonna be an big. extravaganza comes to Shovel, Tennessee. Now the for, now the one I'm more into. I'm co-directing it with another director at the Fly. Her name is Sue. Uh, I'll talk more about her as the progress goes on. Uh, I'll, I'll be directing the second big show, the second small show, which is a version of Gift of the Magi. Oh, The nice. story by O'Henry. Okay. I love huh? that story. Yep. But the big show, talking about front-loading content, the big show, not the wrestler, but the big show, is going to be a a retelling of A Christmas Carol. Whoa! Now, now not so much as a, like, we're changing the plot or anything, but instead of doing, like, the traditional... Uh, you know, full Victorian England uh -huh. get up. We're going to be telling it with like basically a minimalist set where actors carry props on and off stage. Okay. And you know, we like, we know what's an actor. We see it. Yeah. All, like everyone's going to be on stage all the time with the props table, How making neat. the sound effects. I'm ex I'm excited for it. Ha. Huh. All right. I'm well, excited. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that as uh, as it progresses. I um I I listened to we I, I alluded to this earlier in the show, um this past week for some reason I listened to uh, our Back to the Future episode of Finding Christ in Cinema. I'm not even sure what number it is. Fifty something, uh, late fifties, fifty six, seven, eight, or nine. <laughs> You know, the late 50s. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and it was really, uh, I enjoyed that episode, listening to it again um, so much. I normally don't listen to our shows, you know, especially after the fact. I'll check them as I'm, you know, editing it and make sure, right. you know, the next day that everything was fine and that I don't, you know, that we didn't have any uh, any problems because that can happen in, in uploading and whatnot. But anyway, I listened to that and and the, uh, the message, you know, really getting back to, we touched on it earlier in the show, but kindness leading to... Repentance, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, and that that uh, that theme, and it just ties in with this episode, um, tangentially, um, and of course our 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 final Star Wars episode, and it really is impressing on me that that the message, the overall, because we we really have a a paradigm, really, you know, finding Christ in cinema, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. um, and that together with the various articles and links and things that you and I are posting on social media during the week and stuff, we are, we are drift compatible. We are, you know, that uh, we're in the neural handshake. In the neural handshake, and and it all ties in with with uh, with finding Christ in cinema. And and I think that I, you know, when I said that Aslan is on the move. Uh, I, I think that um, I, I think that there's I don't know I don't want to sound like a kook or anything but I, I think that God is sending a wake up call to American Christians and uh, saying you know what the way that you're going let's try a different course now and let's 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 try and and, and do act justly and with 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 kindness and mercy and to walk a little more humbly. Let's do that and see how that works. See if that works a little bit Let's better for you. Let's try it. Yeah. And uh, uh, so anyway, uh, if you haven't listened to that episode in a while, go back and listen to that and listen to how um, Marty McFly was was um, discipled by Doc Brown. You know, that's another that's another meme. Our show is discipleship. We're constantly talking about discipling people. Well, that's what we're trying to do with the show. Yeah. Go out and make disciples. That's, yes. That's the whole network, baby. So anyway, that's what I did. That's well-mannered frivolity. I don't know. Do you have anything else for that? Are you ready for a lightning round? Let's, let's just skip the lightning round. We're already the longest episode yes. ever. Yes. All right. What are we going to do next week then, or next episode? Well, we're going back to the MCU. The MCU? Marvel, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You're all right. It's about time. And we're going we're gonna to look at some Thor Dark World. Oh, in, an, in anticipation for getting to Avengers Age of Ultron, which should be coming out shortly on DVD. So we may even do that the following episode. May, we, we may. We okay. may. Yes. So, keyword may. So it's going to, if all things uh, work out well, it will be a Marvel two week bender. And we're looking forward to that. But hey, whatever, Ooh. hey, whatever turns out, it'll turn up right here. 
Finding Christ in Cinema is live in the GCT network each Tuesday. No, Thursday. Let's do Thursday next time. Sure, yeah. Okay, each Thursday, Lord willing, at around uh, 4 p.m. Eastern time. So join us for live video and especially chat using the chat room and video player at gctnetwork.com slash live. Finding Christ in Cinema is part of the Great Commission Transmission Network, a listener-supported ministry using new media and social networking to equip and encourage you to go into all the world and proclaim the good news to everyone. To find out more and to partner with us, visit us at gctnetwork.com slash donate. Now, if you want to witness the firepower of this fully armed and operational ministry, including all 73 episodes of Finding Christ in Cinema, Brendan's Monday movie reviews, and links to our social media profiles, visit our website at christincinema.com. Do you want to send us an email? We're, please do. We're, we're always, I mean, the mailbox is always open. You could be like Ron of the, oh, sorry. You could be like. Oh, like who? <laughs> of the Rogues. <laughs> or David Gaddy or anybody else that uses FCC at gctnetwork.com. Do you want us to, do you want to call us on the voice line? Do you want to know a secret? You can call us on, you can call our personal private cell phone numbers yes. at 507-407-GCTN. <laughs> now, that was Michael's number. Here's my number. Okay. 507-407-4286. <laughs> now, let's say you want to uh, listen to the good old podcast, yeah. but you, you love falafel. Who doesn't? I love duct tape. <laughs> you, you're not so sure about duct tape. Well, I don't like falafel. And, he, and the air got to it. The air got to it. <laughs> Have you ever you heard can... of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates? Yes. Yeah, sorry. You can go to iTunes, you can go to Stitcher, and you can go to Tune In Radio for Finding Christ in Cinema. Babbling, bumbling band of baboons. And for all the shows that we produce here at the Great Commission Transmission Network, including our brothers in Texas, the, the Theo Nuts podcast, get over to our official website at gctnetwork.com. Brendan Taylor, anything else? <laughs> No, I'm good, man. That's it? Yeah, that's I right. don't understand. You have nothing else? No, no, no. I'm good. Inconceivable. And that is a wrap! I told you he was tricks. It's stuff like this that gives me trust. What a bunch of hippy dippy baloney. Not tell anyone else of your bursting. It's pretty mind blowing. That's just as fascinating as the first 89 times you told me that. I'm afraid you're just too darn loud. It's ghastly. <sighs> And that is... Oh, I already said that. <laughs> okay, let's see if this is going to save the video this week. So, friends, if you see this on the tubes of Yube, then it saved it. Let me uh, go ahead and stop. So thank you for tuning in or watching. After the fact, join us here each Tuesday. Well, no, we're going to switch it to Thursday now. <laughs> 4 p.m. Eastern Time. There you go. At ChristianCinema.com.